The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have had a rough history. They rocketed to popularity in the 80s, which span out of control by the mid-90s, and although some successes have kept them relevant, most attempts at new media often didn't work, despite fans' general approval. With seven years since a release in theaters, and six with a series that anyone actually remembers, of all of the people to come along, why not one who pretty much destroys everything he touches? Enter Seth Rogen's take on every everyone's heroes in the half shell. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem kicks off with Dr. Baxter getting swatted for his research into the mutagenic ooze. After the raid goes awry, his main test subject, later known as Superfly, escapes with his fellow animals to buzz another day, while the glowing neon green mutagen is somehow missed by the guy standing directly over it, and it falls into the sewer. Fifteen years later, Splinter has raised his four adoptive children in more or less the same way they've always been, but due to the internet, they have a longing to join human society. Splinter disagrees, because the last time they tried this, they were almost killed, which drove Splinter to hate all humans. After messing around on a rooftop, the turtles accidentally instigate April Shaquille O'Neal, leading to her moped being stolen. They retrieve it and reveal themselves to April, which goes over rather smoothly, probably because she sees herself in the mirror every morning. After getting to know each other, the five hatch a plan to expose the mysterious Superfly in hopes that people will forget April's past failure of being overridden with anxiety and vomiting like Gary Johnston during a live broadcast, and the turtles can be accepted by humans. After gathering information, the turtles go to capture Superfly, who, to their shock, is also a mutant, along with the other subjects from Baxter's lab. Bebop, Rocksteady, Leatherhead, and more have arrived and are as surprised as the turtles. So, they all hang out, bowling, eating pizza, and Superfly reveals his plan to turn animals the world over into mutants and become the dominant life forms on the planet, enslaving humans. Why? Well, this group also tried to be among humans but concluded they should be eliminated instead of hiding like Splinter. Yes, because we didn't see a variant of that in Michael Bay movies or The Amazing Spider-Man. Disagreeing with this plan, the Turtles fail miserably to prevent Superfly from completing his machine and are captured by Cynthia Utram. After an awful action scene, they escape with Splinter's help and catch up with Superfly. But instead of fighting, they ask the mutants nicely to not wipe out humanity. Now, with only 20 minutes, remaining by this point, all the mutants agree, except Superfly, who fights them all alone. He loses and is dropped into the ocean with the machine, which mutates him into a giant monster made out of ocean creatures, like horses and giraffes. You might think I'm playing, but I'm not. So, he goes to smash New York, but the Turtles and mutants join forces and battle him, saving the city. They are all accepted by humans, April is no longer made fun of, and a sequel is baited so hard you'd think you were being catfished. Right out the gate, the Turtles suck. They are the core of this franchise, and by the end of this movie, you'll be asking the Foot Clan if you can join. Finding unique personality in the Turtles would require more effort than locating the Higgs boson. They're all the same copy-pasted Michelangelo, but detuned. No one listens to Leonardo. Raphael's anger is as hollow as a high schooler's Facebook pity posting. Donatello plays video games. And Michelangelo... twerks. They are social media obsessed children who prattle on as though there wasn't a script to read from, like the ad libbing in Ghostbusters 2016. And they're fucking useless in combat. For example, in retrieving April's moped, the turtles' years of training doesn't amount to much, as the thugs mostly knock each other out like it's a game of Smash Brothers with team attack on. Yet later, during a montage of gathering information, they're invincible. But when fighting the other mutants, it in particular Superfly, they get their shit slapped like the Colonial Marines. The sole reason they survive any encounter is due to their plot armor being thicker than their shells. In the climax, the mutated Superfly picks up the turtles with his pincer. We see the turtles' shells cracking under the pressure. They should be turtle soup, but survive because the movie decides to rush through Splinter's character arc to not hate humans anymore, and five minutes later, the turtles still haven't been turned 
turned into wax as the people of the city join the battle. Considering this is a Seth Rogen project, of course he brought in a bunch of friends to fill out the roster. This means a lot of mutants because scope and scale don't exist in Rogen's vocabulary. After these characters are introduced, the turtles become almost secondary in their own movie. As was summarized, the fight leading to the climax is 95% mutant, 4% splinter, and 1% turtle. The mutants are why the turtles return to New York in a timely manner. The mutants and New Yorkers are the reason the turtles survive. And yet, the mutants also suffer the same copy-paste issue affecting the turtles. Excluding Superfly, the rest are just Mondo Gecko with different skins. I'm convinced Rogan couldn't write unique characters if you suspended him over a pit of chainsaws. Now that I think about it, Rogan must have thrown April O'Neil into said pit so he could cast the wrecking ball Miley Cyrus wrote. This is the official concept art for the movie. Jimmy Kimmel in blackface didn't look this bad. Why is Hollywood so afraid of beautiful women? If it isn't people doubting black women can be beautiful, then it's casting directors reading Ginger with dyslexia. Topping it off, four writers couldn't ascertain a defining trait that wasn't projectile vomiting. April's inclusion is almost as unwarranted as Splinter's speciesism. No hyperbole here. Splinter genuinely, for a moment, considers Superfly's offer to enslave humans. I get you were attacked, but you knew they wouldn't like you and wandered up there anyway. Master Splinter is a moron, and like April and the mutants, he only changes his ways because the plot demands it so this bloated and fast-paced dumpster fire can conclude. Now, to briefly touch on this point, there is a claim that Splinter is gay. I can confirm this is not true. Apparently, this resulted from a poster featuring Scumbag with the word himself on it by mistake. So, there you go. Uh, Splinter isn't gay. This doesn't change the fact that Splinter French kisses Scumbag and they fall in love, because that was such a laugh-out-loud moment, right? Of course, the jokes, if you can call them that, are awful. The main running joke is Splinter's fear of getting milked by humans, which should have been a comment early on, then completed later Instead, the joke is repeated a dozen times, and I already ran out of goodwill back when the trailer first showed that this was a Seth Rogen project. I mean, it is stunning how lacking this film is in the comedy department. Michelangelo is the funny man of the group and cracks as many jokes as an introvert in a library. I think the attempt at humor that epitomizes the emptiness of this movie is when they mock Leonardo's name. For the two people unaware, the turtles are named after the four great artists of the Renaissance. This gives their names meaning. In this fucking movie, the turtles discuss having last names so they can enter school. Leonardo then suggests splitting their names. And so, his brothers mock him as Nardo. <laughs> it actually sounds just as annoying as that, and I was really hoping, genuinely, in this moment, that the Shredder would appear and turn them into fucking ashtrays. If that doesn't emphasize how little a shit Seth Rogen gave about this movie, I don't know what does. The only positive Positive is the art style, which isn't a guarantee, considering some of these designs are fucking hideous. Logistics don't matter, like this is an episode of Hell of a Boss. The characters have less personality than the T-1000, and at the current rate of this film's box office performance, it may be another five or more years before we see another big screen turtle movie. Hopefully with a halfway decent writer who isn't trying to dethrone Willie Nelson. I know it's been years, but I genuinely think Michael they handle the turtles with way more care and respect, and that says a lot. Now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.